Hello uh, and welcome. First, thank, thanks for sticking around with us at, <laughs> at this hour. So I think that, or I assume that we have a room full of Apache Flink or IoT fans, which is awesome. Uh, so we've been already introduced. Uh, I'm Jakub Piasecki, working for Freeport Metrics. That I'll be presenting for my company today, uh, co-presenting with Fabian Huska, uh, co-creator of Flink, working for Ververica. Ver 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 OK. Uh, so today, first, I will talk a little bit about IoT data and uh, how IoT applications uh, are a bit different from other applications. Then Fabian will talk a little bit about Apache Flink and how it helps with IoT. Uh, then I will take over to, ju to talk, talk just a little bit about how we use as Freeport Metrics Apache Flink, Flink to build an asset tracking system for one of our clients. And then I will pass it on again to Fabian to talk about different IoT use cases. OK. So what is so special about IoT data and IoT applications? Uh, when I started cr creating this presentation, the first question I asked to myself was, how much data do I generate consciously or unconsciously? And uh, it surprised me when I thought about it. And not, not to say that it scared me, but I'd like, to, I'd like to you to walk through this exercise with me today and think about how, how much data, data do you generate. Maybe you drove through a, an automated toll booth at the highway, or maybe you rented an electric scooter. And when I, when I thought, like, how, what data I produced like, more frequently, uh, maybe you did a, like a self-checkout at the grocery store, or maybe you used a GPS and your data was, was sent to some servers to create traffic information that is sent to other users. Or maybe you interacted with the smart home device. And then when you think like what kind of data you produce basically every day, some data that is sent and stored at some, or processed in some data centers, uh, Maybe your utility company is using smart meters, and when you woke up today morning and you started your coffee machine, this spike in energy usage was stored somewhere. Or maybe you are using a fitness tracker, and your pulse is measured every five minutes, let's say. Or maybe there are applications sending your locations in background. Uh, OK, so we just covered, like, some examples from everyday life. But uh, there is another type of IoT data, which is industrial data. And some use cases can be like measure, measuring solar firms data. On may maybe when you arrived here at Berlin, your luggage was automatically tracked uh, by a system. Or maybe you can imagine sensors along a production line. And uh, I believe that we will see more and more IoT use cases coming uh, because there are more sensors all around us. Some of the like more interesting use cases are, in my opinion, like predictive maintenance, uh, all the use cases related to smart cities and uh, smart buildings. There is a lot of going on in healthcare as well. Uh, like you. Like you saw, like those use cases create a very broad spectrum, and some people may argue that some of the examples I presented are not strictly IoT data. Uh, to be honest, I, I spent some time before the talk to verify whether people consider mobile phone produced data IoT data, and many don't. But all of these data share common properties. One common property is that there is just a lot of data produced. And Cisco predicts that in 2019, there's going to be 500 zettabytes produced. There's a lot of data. This number may seem abstract. What I think is important that even if you assume that 10% of this data is useful, it's still much more that it can be stored in data centers. So some of this data needs to be uh, uh, processed, or there's a ch chance for this data to be processed in real, ta real time and still be useful. Of course, like the 
for a regular application developer, that's another problem. But even on a, on a smaller scale, you, you can see that the, the amount of data that is generated automatically can be pretty large. Uh, the second uh, property that is common to many of the use cases is that you need to deal with latency, late, latencies and data that comes out of order, uh, especially when you transfer it through a mobile network. Uh, oftentimes in industrial use cases, you have gateway, gateway devices that add its own latency and buffer data. And of course, you need to deal with failures. The third property is that flow of the data is continuous, which means that you want your system to be available to ingest this data and process it as soon as possible. Uh, and I think like, like for the old streaming applications, uh, basically users don't want and sometimes cannot wait. Data is governed in the real world and needs to be processed and influence the real world. What I mean by that, let's imagine you have like a uh, valuable piece of equipment, the new track, so you would rather know sooner, sooner than later and then this piece of equipment is leaving your facility. Or let's say in case of predicting maintenance, the sooner you stop the machine that you think may fail, the, the higher chance of, uh, for the machine that it, it not fails. So uh, as we covered the basic properties of uh, IoT data, I would hand over to Fabian so he can talk about how Apache Flink helps with it. Yeah, thanks. So, um, yeah, so I'm, we right now cover basically what is, what are the properties of IoT data and uh, IoT applications. And, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about Apache Fling and how it addresses these uh, requirements. So, um, for those of you who are not um, familiar with Apache Flink, uh, I have a, like, brief uh, intro slide here to, like, give you the right context. Um, Apache Flink is a distributed system for stateful stream processing. So um, it ingests streams of data and process them, processes them as uh, the data is basically arriving um, in the system. It's stateful, so um, um, certain computations require that you keep some state around. Um, so imagine the simplest example is you want to count how many uh, how many events you arrive from a stream. So there's a count, some some counter that you need to increment, and whenever you get a new event, you have to increment the count, and then this variable is basically the state that you, uh, that this application uses. And as it is a distributed system, you also kind of like need to ensure that this state is not lost in case something goes wrong. So uh, Flink applications are also distributed on tens or hundreds of uh, machines. So it's very f common that something goes down and uh, goes wrong, and the process go process goes down. So you need to also ensure that this state has been uh, able to, to to be recovered. So it's a distributed system. It processes data streams and. Um, yeah, that's kind of like what Apache Flink is, and now I'm talking a bit about the, uh, the the properties that make it a good fit for IT data. So number one is um, obviously that um, Apache Flink processes data with low latency. So we heard before that many of the applications require a timely response to, um, to to certain things that were measured by sensors. Uh, GPS sensors or IF, uh, RFID tag readers or whatever, uh, whatever the source of the data is. But oftentimes you want uh, the application to uh, respond uh, fast to fast to this. And a Flink um, has a couple of properties that make that 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 make processing uh, of data uh, possible with low latency. Uh, first of all, uh, state is always locally maintained, so Flink does not store. Uh, state in a distributed database. For instance, like the count that I was talking about is always kept on the local machine that is processing the events. So you don't, uh, not calling to a uh, uh, remote key value store to, hey, what's the latest counter? You get the res uh, result back, you increment it and write it back. Um, instead, all the state is locally maintained. Either in memory or if your state grows too large, you can also put it on ROCKSDB on the, on the local hard disk. Um, the network stack is, um, is optimized for low latency, so we recently um, improved the stack, um, having um, 
a mechanism called a credit-based flow control that basically um, helps the system to, um, to, to know from which channels to consume data. There's a pretty much uh, pretty detailed blog post that we recently published on the Flink blog, so if you're interested in this, I would just point you to this blog post. And um, the way that Flink supports um, um, state consistency is checkpointing. Uh, the checkpointing mechanism is also designed in a way that whenever the system takes a periodic checkpoint, there's uh, as little intervention in the regular processing as possible, and we achieve that by uh, doing these checkpoints in an asynchronous fashion and uh, also support for income of the checkpoints. So the next uh, reason number two is uh, Flink's distributed system and it sca can scale to large uh, data volumes. Um, what this basically means is that data streams are, are partitioned, so it's, um, and um, therefore we distribute the data and we also distribute the computation um, to possibly many machines in a compute cluster and um, basically uh, by just routing the data to, to, to different processes, we can scale out the computation. Flink applications cannot run at very large scale, so at uh, 10,000 plus cores, um, and also process huge amounts of events. So, uh, for instance, Netflix is uh, using Flink at a uh, pretty, pretty large scale, uh, processing five trillion events every day, which is like uh, about 50, 50 million events per second. And um, as I said, by like distributing the, the, the state, we can also like, um, you, can, you can think of this, that this state is like distributed in the commute cluster, similar to a key value store. So um, we route, route the data to where the state is, modify the state locally, and then uh, keep on going. Flink is also support for scaling the application um, out and in. Um, so that is also possible if in, in case you, uh, uh, your application has some some kind of like a um, pattern where you need to ingest more data or, or less data over time. You can also adjust the parallelism. Reason number two, uh, uh, three. Um, as we heard, IoT data is often um, well uh, not of the not of, not of the best quality. Uh, it arrives out of order. Sometimes sensors produce uh, a bit of messy data. Um, Flink. Um, is able to uh, perform computations in event time. What this basically means is that Flink uh, processes data based on a timestamp that is encoded in the data um, instead of processing data when it arrives at the, at, the, at the processing machine. So imagine you want to, for instance, uh, count something every five minutes or for, for five minutes you want to know how many, how many um, events you received. The easy way to do it is to look at the watch or let, let the computer uh, check what is the time now and then collect all the events until five minutes and then you're done. But this technique obviously depends on uh, how much the uh, machine can consume. If, if there is like too much pressure, it might get bottlenecked. Um, and the correct way of doing this is really using the timestamps in the data to perform these computations. Um, there is this concept of watermarks which basically control, gives, um, uh, is, is a mechanism to uh, let the system know uh, about the progress of time in the stream. So we said that every record has, has a timestamp um, and with watermarks Flink can, uh, or a system that uses watermarks can reason about um, what timestamps to, to, to expect. So it gives some, uh, gives, gives an application a way of reasoning about the completeness of a stream and uh, by that it can perform a certain computation where it knows, okay, my stream is now at 12 o'clock, it can perform all computations that um, received all the data until 12 o'clock and then also discard the state possibly. Um, it also, Flink has also some, uh, some built-in API primitives that make it very easy to smoothen uh, inaccurate or imprecise sensor data like uh, GPS. Um, signals or, or temperature sensors, so you can like also uh, smoothen that out uh, with just like one command basically. Yeah, um, IoT applications um, should, um, some of these uh, provide mission critical um, um, infrastructure um, and you also, you basically want them to uh, run continuously um, and in Flink 
we achieved that by um, having these checkpoints that I was talking earlier about. Checkpoints um, basically guarantee that the state that an application has is never lost. Um, instead, uh, Flink provides exactly once guarantees for the state. If something goes down, Flink will, the Flink application will basically load the state that is, has been written to some persistent storage in HDFS or S3. It will load this copy of the state, load it again into the application, and then the application will um, continue as if nothing ever happened. So the state also includes the reading positions in the source streams like Kafka offsets, for instance. Um, yeah, Flink is also support for um, highly available setups. Um, and um, can also run in different resource managers together with Zookeeper. Um, Flink will um, also be able to recover from master failures and uh, just deploy the new, uh, new processes and again continue as if the uh, error didn't happen. This is a very nice feature, often in IoT applications. Um, these uh, the, these um, some some of the applications basically uh, measure real time events, and you want to um, figure out whether or you have a certain pattern in mind uh, in which events should happen. For instance, um, um, you're, um, you're you have an application that uh, receives an order, and then the order should be processed internally, and finally should be shipped. So there's like three events that you want these to happen in a certain um, in a certain order and also within a certain time frame, um, then you can define such a pattern. In Flink, um, has support for um, so-called CP library that is um, based on the data stream API in which you can define a pattern, basically um, saying, hey, I want first event A to happen, then I want uh, event B or C to happen, and finally I want an event D to happen. So you can define these like regex-like patterns, and uh, when you then deploy such an application, it will like just monitor the stream, and whenever the pattern matches, um, you get, a, you get a, a new event and can um, implement an application that just acts on this event. Um, there's also, you cannot only do this with this CP library, there's also um, a recent extension of the SQL standard. So SQL uh, 2016, there was this match recognize clause added, and this is pretty much um, exactly this. So you basically define a, a pattern over some ordered relation um, and um, can, can react to that. So this is something like a prime use case for SQL. Um, for, for, for streaming SQL and Flink supports also streaming SQL so you can even implement these, these kinds of patterns uh, in a SQL query. And the really nice thing is that you can combine it also with data analytics. So you can either uh, first um, have this pattern and then basically count how often did this pattern occur in five minutes, but you can also turn it around and first do um, um, perform some aggregation and uh, create a new event whenever a, a certain threshold was uh, was exceeded and then have a pattern depending on these uh, thres threshold exceeding events. So you could like figure out if something uh, violated your SLA uh, twice within a certain time frame. So I think this is a pretty pretty good match for, for many IT use cases. Finally, or not finally, it's number six. So. Uh, it's well connected uh, with uh, many other um, systems in the in the big data space. So uh, also with mes messaging systems like uh, Kafka, Kinesis, uh, Pulsar. Um, it is uh, Flink can uh, write to uh, Cassandra, Elasticsearch, or JDBC databases, but also to files in different file formats. So there's a bunch of connectors uh, available. And finally. Um, I would argue that data streaming is uh, like conceptually simple, um, and this is basically also, uh, I would argue, the natural way to, to think about handling IoT events. So you get a consistent stream of data um, that you want to process one by one, and this is basically something that Flink uh, makes, makes, makes quite easy. Uh, due to its uh, API, the data stream API, um, this um, has a couple of higher level primitives, like uh, 
for instance, joints or uh, window aggregations, but also allows you to go deep into uh, into into um, like the core primitives of stream processing, like state and state and time. And um, by implementing your your application against the Status Stream API, you can like scale it out basically to any size. All right, with this. Um, Introduction to Flink. I'm handing over to uh, Jakob again, uh, who will uh, tell us how uh, he built an asset tracking system with Flink. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, like Fabian introduced, I will talk a little bit about how we at Freeport Metrics built an asset tracking system for our client, Evan Ho. Uh, a little bit where we are coming from at Freeport Metrics, and we are a B2B digital products development company. So to decipher it, we build software to, uh, for companies that sell this software to other companies. And over the years, we've worked on quite a few projects related to uh, industrial data processing or IoT data. Uh, some of it were, we work on projects for solar and wind energy Farm analytics, we worked on a couple inventory and warehouse systems. Uh, we worked on automated retail kiosks. Uh, but I think the important part is that uh, this was our first project with Flink, and before that, we were re relying on more traditional ETL approaches or our custom code for ingesting events or on processing them. Uh, okay. So, uh, what is an asset tracking system? Uh, to give you some use cases, the most stra straightforward use case is inventory management. So basically, you want to track if you have all the things that you should have. Uh, the second use case is, is you tra can track shipments in a warehouse. But I think the pretty cool use case is, uh, and actually one of our first pilots of our client is that you hand out RFID uh, wristbands to, to patients and families in the waiting rooms in the hospital can see how those patients go through different steps of medical procedure. Uh, and what's the source of data in, 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 in an asset tracking system? First of all, you, you have RFID tags. There can be many of, of them, like hundreds of, of thousands, and those tags are tracked by RF, RF, RFID antennas they are sent to gateways and then to the backend systems. By besides those uh, tags that are tracked automatically, you have also users with uh, handheld barcode scanners and of course, obviously like mobile and uh, web interfaces. Uh, okay, so I, Fabian is definitely like an expert in, in, in Apache Flink, so I will talk about, about the thing that I think was the most useful for us in uh, at Freeport Metrics when we used Flink, and I think this is the uh, computational model of Flink. And one, I think the most powerful feature is event time. Like Fabian mentioned, like you, when you have data from multiple sources, this, this data will come out of order. In our case, we have RFID antennas, we have users using mobile devices, you got those, all those different latencies from those different sources and to be able to make any sensible results, you need to order it accordingly. The, sef the second thing is uh, referring to what Fabian said. Uh, Window X is, all, is ver a very useful feature for cleaning up your data. In, uh, in the use case that we worked on, you may have like overlapping antennas, so the same antenna is reading uh, so two antennas are reading the same tag, like almost at the same time. So using window, you, you can apply some heuristics and to, f to figure out wh when, where the tag really is. Uh, the second thing is uh, state. And I think the powerful feature of Flink and is that you like forces you to partition your state. And in our case, we, we could partition uh, all the events related to one asset related to tag to tag into like one let's call it group and uh, but what you g get from that is that it is automatically parallelizable and of course it affects performance and the second thing about state is 
when you have state, you can build state machines and do some more complex logic. In our case, we built a simple version of like a business process modeling tool, which has let us model situations like, let's say you have a patient that enters a waiting room, then the doctor's office, and then the recovery area. And you can also use time, like if 10 minutes pass, we know that the procedure is over. Uh, a little bit about our experience, like developer's experience with using Apache Flink. First of all, we had a pretty small team to and we work alongside our clients' team, but that that were not many of us, and so we didn't spend that much time like on, on this event processing part. Thanks to thanks to all the uh, functionality that Flink provides, so that was very useful for us, and that has progressed on other parts of the system. Second, related to that, we could focus mostly on our our core logic of of the application. Uh, another thing is that. Flink provides different levels of different different levels of abstractions and different APIs, and I also think this is very useful. Uh, you can work on high level, or or you need to cust customize on processing function level uh, to and adjust it to your use case. Uh, needless to say, the integration with uh, with with tools and Kafka is very good, and uh, the challenges, the interesting part. Uh, Referring to uh, to Flink being conceptually simple, uh, I have to say, like for our team, it was like a new way of thinking. But I think like it's well worth investing. After you get used to this uh, new programming model, it appears like the natural ways of doing things. Second thing is that uh, it. <coughs> Adding a new feature may require serious planning. I don't have to convince you at this conference that distributed systems are hard, but also you need to get understanding from all your team members that uh, the change that may seem simple from user perspective may require like significant adju adjustment to the system under the hood. To give you some examples, it's Im it is very important what you use to partition uh, partitioning of your data and or how do you uh, work with latency in the system and the fact there's users that want to see some events immediately or can update uh, application from user interfaces that require cons like instant interna interaction. Uh, and the last item is uh, like three years ago when we started working on the system with our clients at, at Evanhoe. Uh, I would say that uh, access to learning materials was uh, limited, but it got so much better in the last couple of days. Uh, sorry, last couple, <laughs> last couple of years. I have to say, uh, especially with like uh, all the like video materials available, and literally in the last couple of months, I can say like if I haven't published a book, so so <laughs> so I, I wish I had three years ago, but uh, that's <laughs> exactly. So I think that it's a good point to hand over to Fabian again. Yeah, thanks. All right, um, so we heard about one um, interesting and challenging use case for, for IoT data um, and uh, the Apache Flink. Um, I was, like when we prepared this presentation, I said, well, uh, we also have a couple of other uh, interesting use cases that I want to uh, briefly mention. Um, we basically collect did most of them. Oh, there's a nice typo. <coughs> um, we collected a couple of um, uh, a nice example, mostly from the Flink Forward conference. Like one of them is um, in data-driven agriculture um, by the company John Deere. Um, they presented this use case um, at uh, Flink Forward San Francisco uh, earlier this year. Um, John Deere, um, as, as many of you might know, is a manufacturer of machines for agriculture, construction, and uh, forestry. Um, and they also run a data platform that provides like data services for farmers. So what they basically do is um, um, their machines, or at least I guess the newer generation of their machines, are collecting lots of data. Um, uh, data that is uh, um, geospatial, obviously, but also temporal, um, and they um, Measure different different things, like for instance, how fast um, a, a planter is seeding new plants, or uh, what's the humidity, or 
whatever. So they're collecting lots of lots of data. And um, this is really like at, at large scale, like a single planting machine produces, for instance, uh, like more than 2,000 sensor, sensor measurements per second. And they collect all of this data, basically, and then um, make it available for the farmers uh, to, to, to analyze it, basically to, uh, uh, to, to investigate um, is how, much in, how much does the planting uh, speed influence or the yield in this area. Um, and so on. So this is uh, really meant to um, help the farmers to um, basically increase the yields of their of their fields. Um, what they're doing is basically they're uh, apparently using uh, Flink on uh, on uh, AWS. So they're ingesting the data uh, from from Kinesis, uh, processing it with Flink, and then. Uh, writing it into a into a data like uh, that is based on S3 or DynamoDB. Another use case is um, is done by by here. This is uh, what they call living maps. Um, this is basically uh, static map data that gets enriched with uh, uh, real time data that is collected by cars. Like uh, for instance, they can uh, figure out uh, they basically they have like a um, uh, getting data from the canvas of the car, so they can figure out something whether a road is slippery, whether like uh, uh, the this, this, uh, signs change due to a construction uh, accidents. Uh, they even measure um, for 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 the um, side uh, side sensors whether there is a parking spot, and can make this uh, information available for somebody who's looking for a parking spot. Um, so um, this also is is a lot of data that has been 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 generated. Um, and being uh, made available uh, by by here. So what they actually do is they have um, a, a platform with a data a data data marketplace uh, where they offer Flink as a service, and you can basically write applications using their data streams to um, yeah get get the data that you need. There is um, also I think this is uh, kind of kind of similar to the to the use case that uh, Jakob presented. Uh, it's about fleet management and construction. Uh, it's a company called Track Unit. Um, they're providing telematic solutions for, um, yeah, for fleet management, mostly in the construction industry. And uh, so they basically uh, um, track where all the, uh, where all the uh, machinery is, how often it is used, whether it's used or not used, um, and can basically um, then the, the customers of this uh, of this service can basically um, figure out yeah where the machines are, um, basically optimize the usage patterns and also uh, make some um, inference about the maintenance intervals. And finally, this is well, this is not a not a real uh, application, but uh, it's uh, it's on the AWS block, so I find it a, a quite interesting use case as well. Um, this is a, basically a blog post that describes how to um, how to do bush fire detection. Um, so they kind of like assume like a multi-hop uh, network of sensors that basically talk to each other, and then basically have some kind of propagation protocol that one sensor broadcasts its information, and then it goes on and on until to some uh, uh, to some um, station that then uploads the data to um, um, to, uh, to 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 the cloud. And then they have a demo using this CEP library that I was talking earlier about, uh, basically to figure out whether there is a bush fire or not, and making making this inference obviously based on uh, temperature chain bands. And then there is like a visualization with a heat map using uh, using uh, Kibana. Yeah, so the demo you can also um, try that out on, on on AWS. All right, so to conclude. Um, so, um, like I would say, Flink, this time without a typo, meets the uh, demands of uh, IoT applications. Um, it's, it serves the, uh, the latency and, uh, and uh, throughput requirements uh, quite, quite well, uh, low latency through uh, local state management, um, volume by scaling out the computation. Um, it has um, good APIs to give you like basic control for the uh, for the right level of, of abstraction that you want to deal with, event time helps a lot uh, with dealing dealing with out of out of order data, and uh, it's been used by uh, 
several uh, IoT projects. And if you have something um, in this in this uh, domain, you should also give it a try. All right. So this is uh, Jakub briefly mentioned this. This is the book that I wrote. Um, it came out, um, I think, like one and a half year, month ago. Um, I'm signing copies. If you have a copy, um, I'll be in the uh, booth area. Um, if you don't have a copy, you can also get one there. It's not at the registration desk, but within uh, the, the booth area as well, right after this talk. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, do you have some question? No? Yeah. Um, first of all, it was a really cool talk. I didn't know anything about Flink. Uh, <laughs> so we use Kafka at Shopify a lot. Um, what would you say are like the main like like proponents of Flink over Kafka? And I guess like the other way around. And I like yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so so you're asking like what's the the, the the difference to to Kafka, right? So I mean Kafka is a is, is a large project which is also doing lots of things. Flink is not a message message queue, right? So it's not uh, you you cannot use it to route data. Um, Kafka the Kafka project also has the uh, some stream processing with the Kafka streams, right? Um, so Flink is. Um, I, w I would argue Flink is. Um, I, I didn't really talk about it because it's a bit uh, maybe, maybe not that not that important in the context of uh, of IoT data. But Flink is also uh, able to do batch processing, so it's not um, only doing stream processing. So we actually see um, well batch as a special case of stream processing. So you could also do stream processing, and lots of the APIs or lots of the things where uh, the community is currently working on are. Um, going into uh, unifying batch and stream processing, and this is like I think an important thing if you look at things like backfilling of um, results that you want to repair because you identified a bug in your somewhere in your in your code. You could just then run the code uh, also on the historic data using efficient batch processing techniques, but also deployed for for your life. Uh, um, Live pipelines. You can also do things like state bootstrapping, which is also important. So you don't want to start from zero. You want to start like with history of, uh, like, say, six months, um, and bootstrap the state using using this. So uh, Flink is really like a, a system that like is is designed or uh, is is aiming to like cover the full spectrum of of data processing, whereas like Kafka Streams focuses on the uh, stream processing part. Um, 